All right. Thanks, everybody. It's really awesome to come share this with you guys today. Um, my name is Archie. I'm from Ithaca. Uh, you saw Jay Shree up here yesterday. Uh, we both work together. And um, what I'm going to do today is share with you how we collect data for analytics to share with our users and customers. Um, and I'm just to be clear, I'm not doing that to sell anything to you. Um, we come from a very, we're not a technology company. We definitely face uh, the academic world more than anything else, like libraries and universities, but we, we also uh, turn all the great work of people like you into services for them. So we, we need folks like you to know that we're doing stuff that's interesting to you. Um, so, oh, gotta hit the right button. All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Ithaca because I assume you haven't heard about us before. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about JSTOR and a quick architecture overview and then hopefully most of the time we'll be talking about our, our data pipeline. Um, so Ithaca itself um, has four different business lines. Um, the main one I'm gonna talk about today is JSTOR, um, but you've also maybe have seen ArtStore um, on the web somewhere. Um, ArtStore is a huge collection of images and JSTOR is um, a, a way for libraries and universities to get access to academic articles and also now academic books. Um, and we have that in 75 different disciplines. So it's not very scientifically focused, but almost everything else is, is gonna be on JSTOR. Um, and we do that in 180 countries. For 5,000 universities in the United States, um, over 150 actually in Michigan are, are, are users of JSTOR, including, including the place that you're in today also as a participant of JSTOR. Um, and actually now there's 8,000 participants internationally, so we have a huge international operation going now. So that, that was a little bit about JSTOR. Um, as far as how we work, we're very much a very agile shop, so we have 18 product teams right now. Um, this one might be fun for this audience. Um, a few years ago, we only had maybe three or four people that was on an on-call rotation. Now there are 97. Um, so that, that was a big cultural shift for us. Um, there used to be maybe one application deployed to production, and now we have 229 applications deployed to production, um, and that's kind of why you need that. But, um, and we also deploy 150, 200 times a week. Um, here is a very helpful diagram describing our architecture. <laughs> um, uh, we're actually an AppDynamics customer. This image comes out of AppDynamics, and I think everybody that uses it for a while ends up this way has to show somebody their completed loop. Um, <laughs> um, here's a, an, another, another visualization of the same thing. Um, and here, this, this, this visualization is actually an output of a program that is a, a consumer of our data pipeline. Um, the bands here represent um, the amount of traffic going between those two items, and it makes a pretty picture. But that's, this is just context. Um, uh, another, another piece of context here, on the left you see a web page. Um, this is the, uh, we, we call this fondly the dried cats article. Um, you probably can't see it there, but you could find it on JSTOR if you search for dried cats. Um, but on the, on the right here, we see a rendering of all the different systems that were called in order to render this web page. So on the left um, is the main application that made those calls. So the, this, the first request was received here. We do some authentication, some identification. We find the content and some personalization and then ship it back out to you on the web. So that's what most of our web pages look like. Um, yes, so another, another piece of context here. Um, this is how often we've been deploying to production over the last five years uh, cumulatively. And um, Mike's talk was great because this, we totally experienced just about everything he spoke about <laughs> regarding Kata. So back here, um, we were just starting out with continuous deployment, and we weren't doing that many deployments a day. Um, but this year, we're probably on track to deploy to production over 8,000 times. Um, I think, I think our, if we were to put that into Kata terms right now, we have developed a Kata for change. We've gotten used to changing things in order to get faster. And um, 
you can see here that every year we've gotten faster every year. That's our acceleration increasing, actually. OK, so finally, this is our data pipeline that I'm going to walk you through. So um, all of those applications that we were mentioning will emit events that we eventually need to show to a library to describe to them how their patrons are leveraging JSTOR. So, um, and this is kind of a funny place to be in um, because you're not personally knowing, oh, I use JSTOR for this. As a librarian, you have to know, like, okay, are, are my patrons being successful with this database product that we're subscribing to? Um, and should we adjust the way that we're using it so that they can be more successful? So they need a lot of information. We have a lot of applications. We like to deploy to production a lot. Um, so we need to kind of bring all that data together and be able to report on it. So we're going to take a tour of this here. All right. So the first stop we're going to take is here with Apache Kafka. Um, we are really excited about Kafka because it, it just provides so many different capabilities to us that we leverage here. Um, so if you, if you don't take away anything else from this, maybe you should check out this article later today um, about the log, what every software engineer should know about real-time real -time data's unifying abstraction. Um, here, Jay Kreps goes through sort of the lineage of Kafka at LinkedIn as it grew up there and goes into a lot of great detail on some really interesting things that they've done with it. Um, in a way, we're still getting started here. So what's a Kafka and why do I want one? Um, so Kafka is a, a real-time fault-tolerant log database. Um, and I, before I used Kafka, I never thought of the log as a really important data structure, but it's probably the most important data structure we have at, at JSTOR right now. Um, so if we were to describe the log as Kafka makes it available to us, um, we have a really a pair of, of, of two things here. We've got a key for every message and a p some bytes for every message. So that's what we're showing here and here. And down at the bottom, you can imagine this producer is just adding and adding and adding and adding on the end. And then for a consumer to follow that log, um, they're kind of following along. So I really wanted to animate this somehow, but I, I had to resist the temptation to, to learn that many new things in one day. So, um, so just imagine the log spinning by here. Um, one difference between Kafka and other queue systems that you might use is um, the queue system sometimes keeps track of which consumers have consumed different messages. Here, the consumer actually keeps track of its position in the log stream. So that kind of turns things around a little bit. So it's kind of like a seekable log. Now, the, the next layer of information here in, in the Kafka model is that the logs aren't just a single stream of bytes. They are partitioned by the key. So the purpose of the key in the message is to give Kafka a way to split your log stream into different partitions. And this is what gives it uh, the partition is sort of the, the unit that provides the, the scalable aspect of this. So you, you can have as many servers as you have partitions. Another reason we do that is, well, that's, that's why you partition it, so you can spread it out. Um, this gives you basically, I ha not infinite, we'd have to test that first, but pretty good scalability because you can, as you have more partitions, you can scale out to more machines. And um, the other place the, the partition is important is for replication. So when you have a log database with important information, you want to make sure that data won't be lost in the case of fail. So um, we run in everything in AWS. Um, sometimes the clouds get pretty stormy, uh, and we need to be resilient to servers coming in and out of the environment. So uh, what we're seeing here is what would happen if we had three partitions and three servers and one of them died or disappeared. The other two machines here would assume responsibility for the other partitions so that you can keep the number of replicas and uh, up, to, up to par, I guess, with what you want. 
So that was, that was Kafka. So now we're going to take a quick trip to the left here and describe how we get the data off the application so that onto Kafka. Um, the, the big challenge here really is making it easy for our engineers to use. Um, we have over 200 applications. Um, that happened very quickly as we decided to transition to this model, so it really needed to be easy for everybody to get started. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Um, because all of our applications run in auto-scaling groups, that creates some churn in the environment as well. So machines are coming in and out all the time. And just being able to see what's going on is also incredibly important. So uh, this is sort of a close-up of how we get data off of an application and into Kafka. So it's going to start over here with the application. And the interface we chose was standard out. So uh, that was probably the simplest place that we could put that boundary. Um, and then there's a couple other components here. So um, this, this little item here is called Biddy Buffer. Biddy Buffer's responsibility is to get the data off of that pipe and onto disk in an observable way. So the data comes out of your app, it hits Biddy Buffer, the data comes to disk immediately, and then Log Buffer is his buddy, and that's he's shipping batches of data into Kafka constantly. Um, we can also see here that we have, um, we do run Graphite. It's OK. Um, <laughs> it's still working good. Um, but we, we need to keep track of how these two processes are going on um, all our machines so that if we need to intervene, we can. Um, but there's also a little health check application here keeping track of Biddy Buffer and Log Buffer. And there's a couple things that he can help a machine recover from if necessary. Um, but if he can't figure it out, he'll go get um, somebody on the ops team. Um, and this is a few set of this is a set of charts describing the metrics that we record out of uh, how we collect the the data. So um, this is sort of describing a, a short event that was resolved automatically the other day, where the number of messages on disk um, was no longer zero and went up pretty high and then recovered. Um, and we can see what instances that was on and what applications that was impacting there. Um, for this incident. Um, it wasn't really an incident because it just fixed itself, but um, the, the messages were delayed in getting into Kafka. But the, the point of this really is that we could see it, and if we needed to intervene, we would be paged and we could take action. All right, so another, another big issue um, in this kind of environment that's constantly churning is that you have to know that the data you're producing is actually legit. Um, so in our continuous integration environment, we have an agent here running um, inside of a Selenium or a Cucumber uh, web browser, running actions against the website, producing messages from our applications. And um, on the other side of Kafka, we have Elasticsearch here that allows the test suite to make sure the data that's being produced there is matching our, our schema has all the desired fields, um, and isn't missing anything. OK, so that was, so now we're, we, we've looked at this, we've looked at this, and um, now we're looking at how we consume messages off of Kafka. OK, and the, the, the main challenge here is how do you know that you've received all the data off of Kafka. Um, we, we display Kafka in a very simple box here, but um, this is a fairly dynamic system in and of itself. Um, the, the partitions across the cluster might change where they're stored, uh, so consumers need to be aware of that and switch back and forth between what machine they're getting them from. Um, and you know, if members of the cluster disappear, like it needs to be able to react to that as well. So here's a few pictures describing that. So we have here a Kafka cluster with a few instances. And we have a topic here with three partitions like this, and another topic that we're not consuming right now on a different set of nodes, um, and a consumer process following that log. And it's a very normal operation for this to happen. Uh, the Kafka cluster realizes that 
it'd be better adjusted or more balanced if um, partition one of the green topic was on the third instance. So that moved over and the consumer process needs to uh, catch up with that. And again, uh, the clouds can be stormy um, and we need to be able to react to that as well. Um, an another issue here is are we receiving all the messages? So um, what we do here to ensure that, or at least to, to, to validate or, or test that we're getting everything that we're looking for is to have a process up here on the top that is gonna publish messages to each partition in a topic so that another process down here can say, okay, did we receive that beacon message within the expected amount of time? If we did not, then go get help. <laughs> Can I tie it up to a user transaction? Uh, absolutely. Um, so the question was, how does this tie into a real user transaction? Um, we're actually going to try to do that live. Um, so I'm going to take a big risk with the Wi-Fi. So fire, fire up your tablets and PCs. We'll need them in a second. <laughs> um, so the last step here is um, how we analyze the data and, and turn it into a, a consumable resource for reporting or other analytics. Um, so let's see. So here, we, we generally do this with Apache Spark. Are there Spark, Spark users out here tonight, today, this afternoon? I see one. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so I'll go light on the detail here, but what, what's an Apache Spark and why do we want one? Um, so there, there's really two really cool features for Spark here, um, which is it, one is obviously that it can handle lots of data. The other is that it can take really um, different types of data and put them together in a, in, a data, in a database resource type of way. So like if you have a CSV, a piece of JSON, uh, a database you can connect to with JDBC, um, Parquet files in S3. Um, you can describe these things to Spark and then query all of them at the same time with the same SQL statement, um, which is incredible um, if you've got lots of data like that um, coming together. Um, and if you haven't tried Spark before, um, Apache Zeppelin is a really cool tool to give you like a notebook to work with Spark. I'm not really gonna go over this today, but if you haven't seen that before, you can download Zeppelin and kind of have a, an, a single machine workspace to try it out, if, and um, it's a fun way to get started for the first time. Okay, so this is sort of a, a workflow of where all the data comes from in our um, ETL process. Um, so we're getting data from the data pipeline, so that is just this little box here in this diagram, and lots of other databases. Um, and the, the, the basic process for how that works is you do the um, extracting data from S3 or all these other sources that I just mentioned. Um, <laughs> the box here says PySpark magic, but uh, uh, that's where you do your, your data transformation, and then we save our output back to S3 where then it's loaded into Redshift or uh, another SQL database. Um, the thing is that we do that over 100 times um, for our ETL process, so the, the little bits here aren't that uh, helpful, but it just gives you a sense of scale. Um, and this is, a, this is also an area where we grew very quickly, um, and we have some lessons learned for you, I guess, um, but you're not very much into Spark, so these might not be very interesting for you right now. Um, but um, it, it just goes into how we iterate here. So we've learned a lot, and we're going to continue to iterate um, on how we do these things. And that was our data pipeline. So how, how does this actually fit in to a user transaction? Um, I have a little demo here. And cross your fingers, we'll see if the Wi-Fi is helping us today. And cool, we have some interesting things. So um, <laughs> what we're seeing on the screen right now is a, a small web page. 
and it's just showing us the queries that have been run on JSTOR since I came on stage um, that have been run by more than one user. So um, what, what's missing here, though, is no one's queried for DevOps. <gasps> Uh-oh. Who has done it? Is it going to get to the top? Amazing. DevOps is number one, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't even ask. <laughs> Um, awesome. So, so if you didn't already do that, what happened? <laughs> um, so here's our homepage, um, and if I search for DevOps here, um, I did actually already did one transaction because uh, I ran a query to figure out there were 12 results, and then I ran a search. So that just happened um, a lot of times so far. Excellent. Um, so that's my demo. Um, so thank you, everybody. <laughs> that went well. Um, do you have any questions? How do you get a Do you get to the point where it has to be able to go into Spark? How is, so how is data fed into Spark, and do you need to feed it in incrementally? Yeah. OK. Um, so. We're actually feeding data into S3 incrementally. So the data starts out here, hits Kafka, uh, goes through a little tool called Secor that reads data off of Kafka and puts it in S3. That's happening constantly. And then when we run um, our ETL process, we run that in Amazon EMR. So this is a nightly job for us right now. So when we need that, we turn on a dozen or a couple dozen machines to go look at all the data that was placed in S3 and then do all of our processing on it. Um, and, and I guess the, the other thing is, I guess other apps would fit into this demo I just showed you. Um, so what's happening here, 84, yes. Better than shark attacks, I guess. Um, so <laughs> so what, for, for the demo, you, you ran a search. That hit our search application. It went to Kafka. And then it's going to this little cloud of other apps where I'm sampling the stream that's going up to my browser. Um, so it's a sample of the data. And then it um, is hitting my browser over a WebSocket. Any other questions? OK. Uh, many other sources. So we, we have. So we have 10 million articles, right? Um, when, we, when we log an event, we usually just log that uh, a user, we identify the user, they pass their identifiers through the data, and also just an identifier for the article itself. So many other data sources includes like our entire metadata database, for example. So title, author, uh, abstract, that sort of information being joined together with the usage information. Any other questions? Cool, awesome, okay. thank you. Thank you, guys. Very brave giving a live demo on stage. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that, I'd be too nervous. Again, let's, thanks Archie, appreciate it. Uh, so a reminder, at lunch,